I mostly read public domain books here on Glenn Reads Books to you, and they were written a long time ago, so they're usually racist or sexist or bigoted. But in there somewhere is a story, and uh, that's why those stories are famous. Other times, I read works from independent authors, and they're delightfully not racist. But they might have uh, adult language or adult situations, like, uh, oh, I don't know, making sex. Uh, So that's your warning. But I'm sure you've grown up enough to handle it. Uh, Don't write to me complaining. Ah, yes. Finally, I can sit down and read this exciting sci-fi adventure story. Listen to you run like a little spaz. Who gets this excited to have an old person read to him? Uh, Well, you're here, so welcome to the Leaves of... Wait, no, Glenn reads books to you, mansion. It's a fun little bit where I pretend to live in a mansion and not just recording in my basement. This is where I read the hottest public domain books and short stories. This week... We're going to read a sci-fi pulp short story called Softy by Noel Loomis. Uh, About Noel Loomis? Sure. He's born April 3rd, 1905, and he died September 7th, uh, 1969. Noel Loomis was born Noel Miller Loomis, that's a fun little catch, on April 3rd, 1905, in the Oklahoma Territory town of Wakita in the Cherokee Strip, and raised in Texaco in the New York, uh, New York, New Mexico Territory, and in West Texas town of Slayton. In later life, he uh, lived in DeSeno in the San Diego, California backcountry from 1956. Uh, He was married to Dorothy Moore Green, who was also a writer in 1945, and there's evidence that he had a first wife named Joni or Johnny, uh, who was the mother of his children, Mary and James Leroy Loomis. Uh, Fun facts? Sure, we'll try to dredge some up. In 1958, he was a Spur Award novel winner for his shortcut to the Red River story. In 1959, another Spur Award for Grandfather Out of the Past. Uh, He wrote Wells Fargo, a history of the Wells Fargo Company in 1968. That's weird. Uh, He wrote for the Bonanza TV series. Uh, He wrote for Have Gun, Will Travel. He wrote for Cheyenne uh, and Johnny Concho, a film directed by Don McGuire, a United Artist, 1956. Uh, this production starred Frank Sinatra and other well-known actors. By accounts of a usual production, uh, has date never been released on VHS or DVD. Eh, that's the best I got for fun facts. I've never heard of this guy, and either has anyone else. So that's all you're going to get. So why don't we go down to the library, and I'll start reading to you this exciting uh, pulp sci-fi story. Well, there you are, why don't you get yourself settled in? Uh, Softy by Noel Loomis. The Galactic Patrol Cruiser Parsec was coasting as she had been for eight months at a speed of roughly, oh, 1250 light minutes an hour. Uh, she had been patrolling the pass, eh? that vast cosmic void between the two Milky Way super galaxy and the one super galaxy of Andromeda. The parsec was uh, oh so immense that a man could die in one end eh, and be buried in space, and those on the other end wouldn't know about it until they read about it in their daily space traveler. She was 41.261 AD model. Ah, only four years old. And aside from fuel, she was theoretically capable of sustaining herself in space for a thousand years, which is just what uh, young Lieutenant Jim Braniff was afraid she was going to do. Hey, that's fun. Uh, Lieutenant Stevens, his roommate, came stamping in from the sixth watch, clapping his hands. Cold outside, he wiped the fog from his glasses. Must be nearly freezing. Here they had a strike in the heating corpse. Uh, the old man better step in and settle that before it gets serious. Lieutenant Braniff sighed wearily. Uh, He'll step in and tell them to go back to work or go without food. Sometimes I think the old man hasn't any feelings at all. Stevens stared at him. Stevens was a handsome, dark-haired, glossy-eyebrowed young man who always seemed to be imbued with the recklessness of space. 
Homesickness eating at you again? He snorted. Well, why don't you go take a walk? Uh, there's some very nice girls over in the kitchens. Uh, 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 it's too far, Braniff said listlessly. Uh, you can catch a ride in the truck if you want to. Stevens tossed his trim space jacket on the bed. Why do they keep sexualizing the Stevens guy? You might as well quit mooning over that wife and kid of yours. It'll be ten years yet before we get back to Earth. Uh, do you really think it'll be that long? Lieutenant Braniff, to tell the truth, was horribly homesick. Uh, he was almost so homesick, he didn't care if Stevens knew it. He got up and paced the floor while Stevens washed his face. Four years from home and six years to go. They had spent three years and four months getting to the pass, and they were to patrol it for three years. Suddenly, he felt he couldn't stand it. I gotta get promoted, he said aloud. That's the only answer. If I could get to the rank of captain by the time we get back, I could raid a job at home, back on Earth. Stevens looked up, his mm, black eyebrows dripping water. Jesus, don't expect me to sit back and wait for you to be made a captain. After all, I can use the money and the rank. <laughs> Braniff knew it. He also knew that Stevens was two years older and three years more experienced, and, if he wanted to face the truth, a lot tougher. Stevens would inevitably get the first chance, unless the Admirable... <clears throat> admirable? What's happening to me today? I'm having a stroke. Admiral should accountably soften, and Braniff saw no hope of that. That very day, Admiral Gorthy had given him a dressing down for failing to report a tube burnt out in the detector. Oh, it's a spare tube in the alternate circuit of the tenth stage of amplification by the grizzled old admiral, eh? Ah, he threatened to keep him a lieutenant for the rest of his life. Why couldn't the admiral be human? Just because he didn't have any family back home, he didn't have to be so tough. I gave orders for you to inspect those tubes every day. That means every day. 24 hours. Get it? Quit mooning. And if everyone were uh, to be like you, we'd never get home. But everyone wasn't as lonesome as Lieutenant Braniff. His only daughter was now three years old, and she hadn't, he hadn't even seen her. His wife, since they'd left the constellation of Laerta, he hadn't even heard from her. Oh, it took too much power to send personal messages so far. You've got to learn to follow orders and do as you're told. That was the old man. Unfeeling, uncaring. The only thing uh, he was interested in was discipline. Lieutenant Braniff could have uh, been very fond of the old man if the old man had been human. I know, he said that like three times now. I get it. All the staff officers felt that way. Uh, the old man was always alone, distant, unmoved by anybody else's troubles. Yes, Admiral Gorthy undoubtedly would give the first promotion to Lieutenant Stevens, and there was not many promotions on a single cruise. Spacemen were physically perfect. And they didn't often die. They couldn't resign, and they couldn't be transferred. So somehow, the life of a space officer was not as glamorous as Lieutenant Brand thought it would be. It would, it would be financially good, for the pay was double uh, what one could get on Earth, and Lieutenant Braniff was economical with his money. The only thing was, uh, the Parsec and his 100,000 passengers was like a detached world coasting through space without orbit, without sun. Without a, without a galaxy even, without without anything, with those great beryllium plates that cut everyone inside from the rest of the uh, four universe, Lieutenant Braniff caught himself in mid stride. Now he better take a turn in the crisp air. Yeah, he was getting moody. No, he was already moody. He put on his jacket, stepped outside, and his breath made funnels of steam under the lights. He walked the quarter mile to the bridge and turned to the big room that housed all the great complexity of the instruments he had to do with the navigation and maneuvering of the cruiser. Uh, this was not the administrative headquarters. That was on the opposite end of the vessel in an alternate control room. This room uh, was only for intermediate problems of moving the ship. He wandered over to the plate that showed space around the ship. In spite of the fact that the uh, plate was positioned on the wall, those black depths were not actually the depths of the past. Few men on the Parsec had ever seen the past itself, and no man there had seen space outside of the Parsec since the day they had left Earth four years before. The story repeats everything over and over again. <clears throat> lieutenant Braniff became aware that the junior lieutenant on duty had spoken to him. I beg your pardon? Uh, what'd you say? I said we picked up something on the detector ban a little while back. Lieutenant Braniff opened his eyes. What? The officer of the day thinks it is a ship. Did they ask for clearance? No. The control room was 
buzzing with talk now. Ah, a junior admiral and two captains were watching the detector plate. It's uh, within a couple of uh, Oz, A dot U dot apostrophe S. I'm going with Oz. The admiral said, watching intently the faint yellow spot on the screen. The young officer with the earphones on his head turned to switch. The sound of a sharp, broken whistle came from somewhere. It's metal, sir, said the young officer. Uh, can you estimate the dimensions? They all waited breathlessly for an answer. No ship except the Parsec was supposed to be in this part of the pass, and certainly no ship on legal business between the galaxies would fail to identify herself, uh, for the entire four universe knew that the Parsec was the fastest and most heavily armed spaceship in that part of the cosmos. Uh, would this be a smuggler, eh, an unannounced battleship, or even a wanderer from some other universe? The young officer looked up. Mass around two million tons, sir. Eyebrows raised. Sounds like Zoot, said the admiral. Uh, that's what we're looking for. Give a reading to the pilot room every ten seconds, and I'll have the control set to follow him. Orderly! A sergeant hurried up. Uh, awaken Admiral Garthy. Uh, request his presence on the bridge. Yes, sir. Braniff hurried back to tell Stevens, and he caught him just as Stevens was crawling into bed. The man bounced out of his bunk and started putting on his clothes. First contact we made in eight months, he said. Thanks for telling me, mister. But don't uh, think I'll give up my promotion. <laughs> Braniff swallowed and tried for a moment to forget about going home. Uh, who's Zoot? He asked. Zoot's a renegade robot from somewhere. No one even knows what Galaxy produced. Nobody knows what he looks like. All we know is that he's done some of the neatest wholesale smuggling that's ever been done in this section. They know he's the one who runs those multiple-armed Stenorians through the pass from the I Super Galaxy. Oh, wait, the one Super Galaxy? I don't even know anymore. From the, oh, Jesus Christ. From the Fox Men of Fommel Hut in our galaxy. Ugh. Who are the Fox Men of Fomalhut? <laughs> Lieutenant Stevens considered. Well, I suppose out of some 40 billion constellations in the galaxy, you could learn about all the worlds. Those Fox Men are on Fomalhut 21. Oh my god, I hate it when sci fi makes up just made up dumb, lazy names. A world about the size of Jupiter. That is, that's their original world. Since then, they've taken over all the worlds in their system, and as that was before the Galactic Federation. Nobody can squawk. But there are trillions of them. Oh, they're highly developed mentally, uh, but they're carnivorous, and, and they're deadly, and they're practically devoid of sentiment. If they can ever get uh, enough weapons, oh, they could raise the devil with the whole galaxy. Luckily, they haven't developed an, op an opposed thumb, so they're physically foxes. Fine, whatever. How do you make trouble, then? Stevens pulled on his boots. They never uh, got very far until they enslaved the reptilian citizens on the Fommel Hut 11. <sighs> this slap a number at the end is supposed to like mean something to us. Now, of course, the reptiles are freed and the foxes are on their own. But uh, we, do that, we do know that from somewhere they get uh, periodic shipments of these ten armed fellows from Stenner. Oh, over in the uh, one super galaxy, uh, in spite of uh, intergalactic regulations, in spite of the fact that by smuggling alone, they could start a war between the galaxies. Is that why we're out here to find out how they're getting their slaves? That's our number one secret order of business. If it's a secret order, then why does he know about it? And he's telling this guy that didn't know. So they say, Stephen stood up and slipped into his jacket, uh, took a last look at himself in the mirror. Come on. Let's move. This may be the only action of ten years in space. Admiral Gorthy was on deck when they got back, with his grizzled face watching the ship on the, on the plate. Oh, it was now fairly plain as a spaceship, but it was shaped more like a, eh, a sphere than the parsec. The idiot, growled Admiral Gorthy. Oh, why didn't he stop? Doesn't he know he can catch him? He acts, said the junior, uh, junior admiral, like some sort of alien intelligence. Uh, he may not figure as we do. He might think that if you could destroy him, you would have done so as soon as you sighted him. Maybe so, but he ought to stop now. Uh, he should at least answer. Have you sent out a challenge on the all-wavelength, Mr. Hale? Aye, sir, said the radio officer. A broadcast on everything we have. Eh? And no answer? No acknowledgement, sir. The grizzled old admiral considered. 
Braniff knew that none of the Parsec's many formidable weapons had ever been fired in action, Gorthy said, Captain, uh, are we within range for your heat projectors? Aye, sir, said the ordnance officer. Gorthy hesitated. Ooh, I don't like to blast a strange ship when I have no idea what in the galaxy she's carrying. Uh... Uh, wait until you're close enough to fuse a couple of the port jets, uh, and then throw a throw a pr- uh, presser beam hmm? and spin her around. Uh, let's show them that we mean business. <laughs> he frowned. Not a like it. There's more going on here than you can see. Five minutes later, the captain of ordnance announced, "The ship is revolving, sir. Uh, she's in an erratic course, about uh, half a million miles off the starboard bow." Gorthy grunted. Watch her. They saw her name, then printed in strange characters that no one could read. Oh, I'd say she's from the third universe, said the junior admiral. Uh, But uh, what she's doing away over there? She could be off course, said the captain of ordnance. Oh, not a hundred thousand light years off course, growled Gorthy. Uh, You're the semantics expert, uh, Lieutenant Braniff. What do you make of her name? Oh, I don't know, sir, said Braniff. The only guess I can make is that those symbols uh, have a mathematical origin. Hmm. And they're definitely not the symbols of the Triangle Men of Theta Sagini. Ugh. Gorthy grunted. I think uh, she's getting ready to make for land, sir, said the junior admiral. Where? Oh, inscription rock, sure. Uh, where is it now? Uh, half an awe, you, an awe, whatever. To the left, sir, minus 20 degrees. Okay, follow him in. The Parsec was pressing the strange ship now. The Parsec's 80 million tons of mass could be stopped very easily. So, Gorthy had the big ship orbited, while uh, he and the staff and some hundred officers of men detached themselves in the Parsec Jr. One of the Parsec's two uh, contact boats, Lieutenant Braniff, Lieutenant Stevens, being officers of the line, were included. The Jr. was expelled by a powder charge? Really? Just a gun blast? At the rear, and immediately began blasting to cut down on her velocity. With what, more powder blasts? Uh, The strange ship seemed badly crippled. Oh, it was floundering in an apparently aimless spiral toward the planet called Inscription Rock. They followed it. Uh, uh, What's Inscription Rock? Asked the junior officer of an ordinance. Uh, Inscription Rock is the graveyard of uh, military ambitions, Gorthy said gruffly. It's an orphan planet from uh, some solar system that nobody can remember. It has wandered around in the past for a million years, and nobody has ever claimed it because it uh, has nothing of value and it's too vulnerable to be worth defending as a base. Uh, As long as it has been in the past, it has been used by conquering admirals, defeated admirals, to stop and repair their ships and gather their fleets. Well, that makes me uh, deeply aroused, so why don't we retire here from the library and go up to my master bedroom where everything's silk. The sheets of the bed are silk. The, the, The walls are silk. The drapes are silk. The ceiling's silk. The floor's silk. Uh, and even, uh, I don't know, the tables have silk on them. So why don't we go up there where I can let you know about the latest in romance literature from Penguin Random House Books. I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh boy, I can't wait to see what outfit you're wearing today. Uh, what? You just dressed like a person from, like, the 2000s. Uh, you look kind of like Stephanie Meyer. You look real, real smug. Like you did something not very talented and are somehow being highly rewarded for it. How are you holding the book? Uh, why don't you let me see what the book is? Love Again uh, by Sophie Kramer. Uh, about Love Again? Sure, why not? A heartwarming love story of love, loss, serendipity, and... Texting. Soon to be a major motion picture starring Sam Hugan and Priyanka Chopper Jonas. Uh, after a heated argument, Clara's fiancé stormed out of their apartment, but before they had a chance to reconcile, he died in a tragic accident. Oh, it's been two years, but she's still paralyzed with grief, and her friends are worried about her. So, to uh, they try to say what's left unsaid, she's started texting his old phone. Uh, what she doesn't realize is that the number's been reassigned. This is a trope I have seen a million times. This is a book. Someone actually took the time to make this into a book. Across town, Sven's fo- They already did this on like a million Hallmark movies. Across town, Sven's phone begins receiving mysterious but heartfelt text messages, and he doesn't respond, but is captivated by the sender. His own relationship has been on the rocks, and when it ends, he sets out to find the person who's been texting him. Neither Sven 
nor Clara know what they were setting out to find, but it would change both their lives forever. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Uh, that's Love Again by Sophie Kramer. It's a paperback for 17 bucks, coming out May 9th, which is probably already out by the time you listen to this. Available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, Bookshop.org, Hudson Booksellers, Powell's, Target, and Walmart. Oh, and as I get it now, Stephanie Meyer wrote a, a crap novel that wound up being a bunch of movies, and this has got a movie tie-in. This is a movie. It's being turned into a major motion picture. I get it. I am so not horny. I'm actually angry. So why don't you just get downstairs and dress normal, or at least look less smug, and I'll see you back in the library. Well, there you are. You finally showed up. Oh, and you're still looking smug. I don't... Clearly, I figured out why you don't have any friends, and that's the reason why you come, keep coming over to my house all the time to have me read to you, because you're a jerk. You piss people off. That planet has seen more intergalactic warfare than any other piece of solid matter in the fourth universe. Uh, they're going to they're gonna find land, sir, said the captain, the junior. Gorthy did not take his eyes off from the plate. Lieutenant Braniff. Yes, sir. Braniff drew up with his heart pounding. Take the number four fighter with a crew of four and arrest the captain and crew of that ship. Burp. And confiscate the ship and the cargo in the name of the Galactic Federation. Burp. Yes, sir. You will be tra- uh, backed by Lieutenant Stevens in number two. Is there any uh, resistance whatsoever? Use the Omega Ray. Yes, sir. Lieutenant Brandt was thrilled. That was a drastic order. The Omega Ray was a disintegrator at short range. It meant that Gorthy was alarmed. Lieutenant Braniff exulted momentarily. Perhaps it turned into a good job on his, and uh, he would re- it would get a promotion. Oh, if you can identify the captain as Zoot, the renegade robot, uh, just kill him without mercy. Uh, we can't stand on ceremony when a wrong move might plunge a hundred billion solar systems into conflict. We'll stand by up here. Be careful. Yes, sir. Five minutes later, Braniff and his crew cast off in a number four fighter. The lieutenant was taut, alert. This was his chance. The strange ship landed rather heavily. Braniff circled her at ten miles uh, with his searchlight on her. Presently, oh, there was movement. A port opened. And a white flag signal. They have white flags in the future, in the galaxy, on, from other planets. Lieutenant Braniff landed his fighter. There wasn't any sun for this world. It was a dead black. Oh, he got out of his bubble and flexible suit and went toward the ship warily, careful to stay in the light. He was remembering what Gorthy had said about starting an intergalactic war. That meant the first thing to do was establish the identity of the ship and to find out its cargo. He signaled his three men to follow him, and they stalked up to a strange ship. A door opened, and a ladder rolled down, and Lieutenant Braniff went up. A ladder? They have a whole ladder came down this... This is the... When he got through this strange round airlock, he found himself confronted by a round-bodied, three-legged creature uh, like an octopus yeah, with ten arms. Uh, he waited for his companions, and then he signaled to the creature, and it moved off. And they followed. In an odd-shaped room fitted with instruments and control levers levers uh, that all ended up in slender tips uh, to suit the tentacles of the creatures that had led them, uh, Lieutenant Braniff found half a dozen more of them. And finally, in the light that was almost blackness, he saw a different form. A bigger form. Steady, he said to his men, and turned on his infralight. Although his filter, or through his filter lenses, he saw a gigantic robot ten feet high, oh, as wide as a barrel. Its steel plates were dull from the long black of polishing. Uh, it was his hands swung like steel pistons at the end of his long arms. Uh, you can turn it off, the robot said abruptly. You've had a good look at me. Lieutenant Braniff felt queer, uh, but he remembered his job. I, I, uh, are you Zoot? Yes, I'm Zoot. You can hear a cat. Apparently the cat's getting it on it. Yes, I'm Zoot. You forced me down against intergalactic law. I was minding my own business. The robot's metallic voice sounded bitter. Hey, you, you didn't identify yourself. The robot's head lifted as if in surprise. You did not signal. Uh, we, uh, we, we did, said Lieutenant Braniff. Uh, what ship is this? Oh, God. The Adrafta from FAD 14. God. Damn it. I know. Uh, 
there, that's not in the two super galaxy, Lieutenant Branham from Zerd. Are these members of your crew from that planet? They are. Uh, where are you from? From the deeps, the robot laughed. Lieutenant Braniff understood that. All oh, the deeps were uh, at, at minus 90 degrees ascension, a void something like the pass where the four universe thinned out, and Braniff overlooked it. Hey, wait, wait, what's your cargo? See for yourself. At that moment, Braniff heard in his uh, internship phone, I have orders to follow you inside in 15 minutes. This is Lieutenant Stevens. Yeah, we're okay, said Braniff, uh, but stay close. To tell the truth, Lieutenant Braniff was living... Ten lives at once. Oh, he was in an alien ship, surrounded by alien entities, talking to a giant robot. And besides that, they were practically in the dark. All these creatures did not need much light. Lieutenant Braniff was scared to death. Lead the way, he said. Uh, he took one man with them and left two to watch the robot. And they followed a three-legged octopus down a low-ceiling tunnel and came to a door. Uh, worked combination, apparently, and threw the door open, and it was lined with a foot's thickness of lead. And Lieutenant Bramp shivered uh, at the strength at those heavy tentacles. Burp, he motioned the creature to go inside. The fadden waddled in. A moment later, it backed out, bearing a heavy lead box, and Lieutenant Bramp observed the Geiger reading and straightened up. Hard radiation. Uh, plenty hard. Uh, if they hadn't been wearing shielded suits... Uh, they couldn't have lived through that. He made some quick tests, and then he went back to the robot. Uh, you'll go with us, he said, and held his breath. The robot shrugged. He turned and led the way out, and Lieutenant Branfix hailed and uh, breathed deeply. Uh, he felt still better when they were outside under the searchlights. Lieutenant Stevens was there in his bubble. And the great robot stood at its full height. It looked around at the men and at the ships, at the contact boat floating overhead, with light pouring from its portholes. Lieutenant Braniff knew that this might mean a promotion. It might mean that he would get a chance to stay home after this trip. Oh, he was happy and elated. But as he looked at Zoot, he felt sorry for the big robot. Ah, he looked a little bewildered. Lieutenant Braniff thought his shoulders eh, slumped a trifle. Then suddenly, Zoot turned and ran. Oh, it's great steel legs taking immense strides over the gigantic rock. Braniff remembered what Garthy had said about using the Omega Ray, but he... Couldn't quite bring himself to do that. Uh, the robot had looked so forlorn and friendless. Eh? And besides, he wasn't offering resistance, though Braniff understood that the Admiral would be pleased at any reasonable excuse for the destruction of the robot. But Zoot couldn't get away. They'd just track him down in minutes because of his metal body. So Braniff stood for an instant, watching. Then Lieutenant Stevens raised his Omega gun. Uh, Braniff saw that, and his temper flared. Why was Stevens so ready to blast a man, or a robot, either, just uh, to grab off a promotion? And why must he shoot a helpless robot in the back? Braniff wheeled his right fist, encased in flexible beryllium, came up hard against Lieutenant Stevens' bubble, and he saw Stevens' head snap back, and then Stevens turned uh, with a look of amazement on his face, and then he stared at Lieutenant Braniff, and then he changed hands on the gun, and he hit back. Oh, the blow jarred Braniff uh, to the bottom of his spine. The bubble seemed to try to lift his head off. They closed. Stevens tried to bring the gun uh, to bear on Braniff's head, and Braniff need him. Ooh, just need him, period. Probably in the nutsack. Stevens backed away, gasping. Braniff followed, and he kicked the gun out of Stevens' hand. How flexible are these suits? Then a per uh, paralysis ray stunned them both. The next thing Braniff knew, he was being helped up. Grizzled old admiral stood there with a puzzled expression on his face. Uh, Lieutenant, will you explain your conduct? Braniff swallowed. He realized now, with a sinking feeling, that he had forfeited all his right to promotion. Yeah, I don't know, sir, but Zoo was my prisoner. Gorthy studied him, apparently in eh, some disgust. Finally, he looked down to where they were bringing Zoot up the rocky slope, and he looked back at Braniff. Uh, come with me. They got into the number one fighter, Gorthy, directed the pilot. Ah, uh, there's a mountain here somewhere with a square face about uh, three miles high. A black granite mountain, he said. The pilot used his radar. A moment later, he had it. Take us there, said Gorthy. Branf was puzzled and a little apprehensive. Was the Admiral getting ready to execute him? The Admiral had the ship landed on a point of rock a mile away, and they got out. The lights were on the cliff, and then Branf saw the cliff was covered with inscriptions and many strange and alien characters. 
All the military uh, commanders for a million years have left their marks on that rock, said Gorthy. This planet has been a place for fleets to rest and be repaired, for rendezvous between forces, and also for defeated admirals to stop and lick their wounds. And every one has left his mark. Look up there, clear to the top, at the left. I can't read that, but I've had it explained to me. Those machine-like marks were made by... Uh, Nudgizz. N-U-D-G-H-J-Z. Nudgizz. The great Regillian semi-mineral general, <laughs> semi-mineral general, who whipped the Milky Way in the first of the intergalactic wars. It says, I conquered all. And he did. He conquered 40 billion suns. Over on the left is the vine-like inscription of the famous Capillian Admiral Lalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalalal
Uh, that's what I thought you said, sir. Uh, pick a crew and get started. The Admiral was studying the sky map. I think, Captain, we'll set a new course when we get back on board the Parsec. I'd like to take a run over toward the one super galaxy and see if I could pick up a clue as to where Zoot got all that Americurium. There must be a new galaxy opening up somewhere, and he wheeled on Brandon. Uh, what the devil are you doing, uh, Lieutenant? Get going. Lieutenant Brandon smiled uh, said, yes, sir. It added under his breath as he saluted, You old softy. Oh, that was horseshit. Uh, why don't we go down to the smoking room where we can talk about what we just read while we smoke cigarettes and uh, cigars. Ah, there you are, with your smug goddamn face. Uh, why don't we just talk about what the hell we just read? A uh, bunch of people on the galactic patrol cruiser called the Parsec supposed to patrol the, a place called the Pass, which is... Uh, my wife put birds in here. Oh, it's so big that the captains on one end never see the uh, engineers on the other. Someone could die. No one knows about it unless they uh, read about it in the, the Daily Space Traveler. Ugh. They're on a ten-year trip to... Wherever the pass with six years to go, uh, the heating people go on strike. Our hero is Lieutenant Jim Braniff, a big baby who's homesick for his wife uh, and his three year old daughter, who he hasn't spoken to since they left Learta, whatever the hell that means. There isn't much of a phys uh, physical description for him. But boy, they talk about his roommate. He's handsome, dark haired, with glossy eyebrows. Glossy eyebrows that at one point is wet. Admiral Gorthy is a lovable pain in the ass that makes it impossible to get a promotion. He's also, uh, it's hard to get a promotion because everyone just kind of lives forever because they're healthy and it's hard to get anyone to quit their position and take a lower position. So everyone just kind of stays exactly where they are for 10 years. They pick up something on the detector band and it's a ship that's not supposed to be there. Uh... They're not sure if it's a smuggler or a battleship. They, uh, we learn about Zoot, a renegade robot from somewhere. No one's even known uh, what galaxy produced him. And, and no one knows who he looks like. All they know is he's a smuggler. Uh, kind of like Han Solo, but less sexy. But ten feet tall, but not as sexy. And, and they know that he runs multiple arm Stenorians or whatever through the pass. Uh, the super galaxy of the Gox Men of... Uh, who? Who are the Fox Men of Fumble Hut? Well, they're Fox Men of Fomalhut 21, obviously. It's a world uh, about the size of Jupiter. They look, uh, they took over all the worlds in their system, uh, so that's cool. There's trillions of them. They're developmentally, they're carnivorous, they're deadly. Uh, they only got as far as, uh, who cares? Uh, the Fox Men get shipments of 10 armed men, uh, fellows from Stenor over in the super galaxy. Uh, even though smuggling's illegal, and uh, it could start a war between the galaxies. And if they know that, then why wasn't a war started when that was happening? Doesn't matter. Who cares? This is not about consistency. Uh, it's revealed that the reason why they're out there is just to, uh, just to find out how they're getting their slaves. They try to talk to the ship with no luck, so they shoot it till it crashes. They jump in the uh, Parsec Junior, which has to be shot out with like a, like a cannon with a powder charge. Uh, Steve and Braniff are told to use the Omega Ray if they see Zoot, which uh, is supposed to be a really big deal. And when they land on the planet, they see a white flag for the porthole, which is silly. A door open and an actual physical ladder comes out. So they go in, which I wouldn't. I'd say find some other better, more modern way for me to enter your ship. But they did. They went in. And they were taking the robot's cargo, which is a box full of radiation uh, called a, what, Ameri Americonionium? Ugh. Uh, and they say, it's, ooh, it's hard radiation, plenty hard. Uh, but Brandon thinks, I want to get a promotion. I'm finally finding a way to escape. Zoot suddenly turns and takes off. Brandon feels like it's not worth killing him because he's made a metal that will find him. So Steven decides he's going to try and get that promotion, so he's going to shoot him. And then they fight. Zoot gets captured. Anyway, Admiral drags Braniff off to a cliff where he can see the inscriptions of all the famous commanders who have had to stop on this crap hole to gas up. A planet where there is no atmosphere, no wind, no storms, no changes of temperature. The inscriptions have been there for millions of years. Isn't that neat? Uh, then the Admiral basically says that Braniff is a uh, uh, sensey poo piss baby. And he only hit Stevens because he felt that Zoot was alone and sad. 
He tells Braniff that he should resign when they get back, but not in a bad way. Uh, some people have morals and they're not fit for military duty. But when the Admiral blows up the ship of the Fadians, or he wants to, uh, just to prove a point, uh, they decide not to because it turns out you can fly that thing back to Earth and why don't you keep the cargo, hey? Huh? I'm not such a bad guy after all. <laughs> uh, so he gets to keep the Mercurium, uh, which is worth a bunch, and he calls the Admiral an old softy. What's good... I guess in this story, in this universe, you can be a sensey poo piss baby, and it's okay. What sucks? Uh, sci fi and fantasy novels, uh, I hate that they make up names without any connection to anything. They just throw a name out there. I've had this in previous ones. Uh, they just throw a name. I have fantasy books. Horrible. Uh, they just throw names out there, and you're just supposed to just kind of remember as if you're some sort of robot yourself. You're just going to have to remember, like, this person comes from Galaxy 1, and they're part of the cat people, and whatever, and you're supposed to pay attention to this. It's supposed to mean something, but it doesn't because there's no reference to it. There's no history. You haven't read anything about them leading up to this moment, so why would you give a crap? Uh, so, for examples, uh, when they're talking about uh, the graffiti on the cliff, you get Nudge Giz, the great Regillian semi-mineral general, eh? only semi-minerals, not all the minerals, who uh, whipped the Milky Way in the first thing of the words, uh, the famous Capillarian Admiral, la 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 la, who with his half-plant people and a billion spaceships from the galaxy swept to a glorious victory in the first uh, galaxy itself. None of that means anything to me. Sardox, was my favorite. Sardox, the evil cat. Uh, Vormal from Sirius. And Fimit from Vega. None of this means anything. So I hate it when they do that. And they do that all the time. What do we learn? Uh, there isn't really much analysis to go over in this story. There's not really uh, any character motivations or anything to go over. It's a pulp science fiction story. Not that all pulp fiction from the 30s and 40s were bad. Uh, but most of them were. Uh, well, nearly all of them were. Pretty much they're all bad. The problem was that they were written on smushed up wood for a paper called Pulp, which is the cheapest option for a cheap publisher back then. So they, most of them didn't pay very well, and they got the kind of lowest of the low for authors. And over time, these crap authors figured out a kind of a system of writing stories that gets them published. Eh, like podcasting. An emphasis on adventure is part of the system. Plot over characterization. Use of dialogue and narration as a means for delivering information rather than actually writing it artisanally. Exploitation of the exotic, whether racial, sexual, socioeconomic, or geographic. Simple emotions strongly expressed. Uh, and good always triumphing over evil. Oh, and don't forget, racism. Popes were mostly racist as hell. Anti-Asian, especially after World War II, portraying black and uh, native people as subhuman or savages. Uh, there's also sci-fi stories where just everyone's white for some reason. Nothing else. The planet Earth uh, has a wide variety of skin tones, but you get out there in space, and oh man, it's like being in Utah. Everyone's white. Oh, sure, you can get a female protagonist that was progressive for its time, being strong and capable, but she's just another white person. So, comparing this story with all that, I guess it's not all that bad. There isn't going to be any clues to the character's motivations because there is none. The conflict used to put pressure on him and show us who he really uh, is produced nothing. It's just a story of a guy uh, who's too much of a sweetie eh, to make it uh, in the kind of career we have to kill squid men. Now, there you go. Oh, thank God. Uh, why don't you uh, go home because it's late and I'm going to go read something else, just so I can actually spend time alone without you in my house. Ah, uh, well, it appears you found me in the part of the podcast I hate the most, where I tell you all about the places on the internet where you can find me. Tell I hate this because of the sound effects making it sound like a stormy night uh, in the drawing room of the damned. Now nah, there's there's that. Uh, I I are you cool? I like cool people. It's the reason why I got involved in this business to begin with, just to meet cool people, not losers. So if you're cool, uh, feel free to go over to my website, uh, nuzzlehouse.com. Which uh, basically just points you to Mastodon. Why did I go all in with Mastodon? I have no idea. But if you go there, it'll uh, point you to my link tree where you can listen to episodes. Which is confusing uh, and meticulous. Uh, but if you want to go to just my link tree, which is L-I-N-K-T 
tr.ee slash nuzzlehouse, it'll uh, point you to all the rest of my shows. Like uh, Glenn Reads Books to You, which you're listening to right now, uh, Just Dating the Curious Mind, where my wife and I uh, write... Uh, paranormal smut and then publish it on Amazon and also Nuzzle House's CBS Radio Mystery Theater where we basically create our own episodes of Radio Mystery Theater a show from the 70s uh, because they don't make them anymore damn it we want to hear something new oh I'm also on Instagram uh, something that I try to use but dislike which is uh, instagram.com slash house nuzzle and uh, the lesser now thanks to uh, Elon Musk uh, Twitter used to be my home, and now I can't stand it, which is uh, twitter.com slash uh, house nuzzle. Uh, and since, uh, since I think you might be cool, you can always just email me directly. glenn.nuzzles at gmail.com But don't, uh, don't email if you're a nerdling or a dork. Now, back to business. I can't believe I drank all of them already. There's gotta be one left. <laughs> 